start with a small exercise. I'm going to show you some claims about our field, and you have to raise your hand if you think they are true, at least partially. So please raise your hand if you think they're true. So our field should be more scientific. Please raise your hand. And keep your hand up, okay? So let's, let's go to the next claim. Novelty is important in our work. Great, good. A good paper reports implications to practitioners. And finally, cognitive modeling is passé. Great, no, thanks. Kasper, what are you doing here? Um, this talk is about belief systems. So these are beliefs like the ones that you just saw. And these kind of belief systems are not like meta-theoretical claims about our field, but they are collections of beliefs that can be uh, not well articulated. They are not necessarily internally consistent, and they don't need to be value-free. Um, so beliefs like the ones that you voted for. And these are tremendously important because they guide our thinking. So when you answer a question like, what should I research, or is this paper good, or are we progressing on a topic, uh, we are driven by these belief systems. And these belief systems, they become embodied in our practices and they become materialized. We see them in the PCS. And they uh, are guiding our goal setting. So that's why it's really important to try to study and explicate what these belief systems are. Because if we have an ill-suited belief system, it can easily corrupt the whole field. Now, do we have any reason to, to be concerned? We see really excellent work here at the, at the conference. But if you take a step back and look at the field as a whole, um, here's what Olson and Olson said uh, 16 years ago in a review paper, uh, that HCI is fragmented across topics and theories and, and methods and people. We're also noticing that there's an increasing number of disciplines contributing to our field. And this means that it's harder and harder to say uh, what is the unique role that HCI has that doesn't reduce back to those other disciplines. And finally, two years ago, there was this argument about the big hole in HCI. In a nutshell, what it means is that the results that we obtain in HCI don't drive further research in our field. So these are serious accusations, so we should be discussing what to do with these problems. And this paper is about one such attempt uh, based on the problem-solving capacity, or this concept uh, coming from Larry Lorden. And I can summarize it like this. Uh, instead of asking whether research is valid or follows the right uh, approach, uh, it urges us to ask how its solutions advance our capacity to solve important problems in human use of computers. Uh, we can expound this concept and use it as a lens to look at HCI, and that's what we've been doing in this paper. We try to capture the, the bread and butter of HCI, the kind of work that you see here at the conference, and to offer something more than just a lens, um, we're describing our identity as a field. Um, we're offering a tool for generating and re uh, refining research ideas. And we also try to be inclusive. So try to be inclusive in the sense that we have fantastic work um, looking at fabrication techniques, tinkering with different kinds of engineering methods. We have fantastic works on design, and we have work on looking at sub-Saharan ICTUs. So how can you be inclusive and give value to that work without being naive? Naive in the sense that uh, assuming that any perspective is valuable just because it's different. Okay, um, a lot has been said about HCI in the past. Here's a small gallery of some of these, these accounts. Some of them come from real papers and some of them are in the PCS, in the review forms. And from the problem solving perspective, um, they are basically filters. They are scoping our work. They are saying that you should not study this kind of problem uh, or you should not use this kind of approach, or, or you should be pursuing this and this kind of outcome. And it's easy to come up with pretty powerful counterexamples to all of these claims. And what happens with the problem-solving capacity, here's the key idea, is that we take the problem and the solution and we form a new unit of analysis called problem-solving capacity. So we ignore the approach entirely and just look at the problem and the solution together. Now, we didn't invent this concept. It comes from Larry Lawden. He's a philosopher of science. And he was debating with, uh, for example, Kuhn. And, and he made this following point. Uh, in appraising the merits of theories, it is more important to ask whether they constitute adequate solutions to significant problems than it is to ask whether they are true or otherwise justifiable within the framework of contemporary epistemology. 
Now, we've been applying this and extending this for HCI, and the rest of the talk is about, well, what did we learn? Uh, first, one important point. So what Larry Lowden means by research problem is not the familiar problem as we use in colloquial language. Uh, rather, it's defined by inabilities and absences occurring in our descriptions and knowledge and in our constructive solutions as a field. It's not the same as a design problem or a problem that a, a user might occur. Uh, and um, the first observation uh, we did with Casper is that you can collapse this crazy hyperdisciplinary uh, field into just three problem types. And it's really valuable because you can start comparing uh, the contributions of work coming from very different traditions and not being bound by these traditions. Uh, what are these three problem types? Um, Larry Lawden introduced two of them, empirical problem type and conceptual problem type. Empirical problem type we all know. Um, conceptual problem type is about uh, interrelationships between concepts and it's a sort of second order uh, problem type. And constru constructive problems is something that we added with Casper, and it is basically about uh, the construction of artifacts using, for example, means from design and engineering. What uh, Larry Lawden also offers us is a, is a typology of types of subtypes of problems going from um, an increasing level of fidelity, uh, from complete absence of, of uh, uh, description to, to refining and retuning these descriptions. Uh, now, we can finally try to define what problem-solving capacity is, try to show that it's something more than what you typically mean by problem-solving. Um, there are five elements to this. First of all, significance, that we're solving significant problems related to human use of computers. Um, this significance aspect, by the way, is often uh, grounded to outside uh, of our field, to industry and society, and not necessarily to the field. Uh, it's defined by things like how many people do we address in our work or how important matters in those people's lives we address. Uh, then there's the solution capacity aspect that is defined in terms of three criteria, effectiveness, efficiency, and transfer. So it means that the solutions that we acquire, basically the outcomes of our work, uh, are evaluated in terms of uh, whether they're solving essential aspects of these problems and whether they solve them efficiently, meaning with as little resource use as possible, and whether these solutions transfer from instances to another one. Uh, with Casper, we added a fifth criterion called confidence, which refers to these traditional concerns that we have about the uh, um, logic of argumentation or validity, reliability, and so on. Now, this is the definition of problem-solving capacity. Now what you can do is you can analyze your work, you can analyze whole topics in HCI, and that's what we do in the paper. And just to give you an illustration of how this works uh, and what the benefit would be, um, I took two classic HCI contributions, tangible bits and Fitts law. Normally you wouldn't even consider comparing them because they are so, so different. Uh, the other one is constructive problem uh, type and the other one is conceptual. Now what do we learn if we compare that uh, with the problem solving capacity perspective? First of all, we should look at the significance of the problems that they're addressing. And their tangible bits is better because if it would work, it would revolutionize basically all of input uh, with a computer. Fitts law, although it's also important, it's constrained to pointing tasks. Then we also have to consider the four other criteria that are relating to the solution capacity. And for the illustrative purposes, I, I collapsed them into just one dimension here. And how it looks like there is that this um, Fitts law is stronger in that respect because it has more uh, efficiency, effectiveness, and transfer. It offers a model with which you can actually work and solve problems, whereas tangible bits has a vision and a set of demonstrators that are harder to then apply to different uh, uh, problems. Okay, so this was just an illustrative example. Now what we wanted to learn with Casper is what could, you, what could, you, could, could we say about HCI as a, as a field, as a whole? And, and for that end, we first had to define what it means to define a field as a problem-solving field. And it boils down to three criteria. What are the problems that we're addressing? What are the desired problem-solving capacities that we're after? And what is the achieved progress in our work? And this is a generic description of a field. Now, we made some cursory first uh, observations about HCI. First of all, that uh, it's easy to find examples of all of these problem types and all of the capacities in HCI. So we are a really, truly diverse field. 
in a single paper, you might easily find even two uh, contribution or problem types, such as if you have a study and a prototype together. Uh, we seem to have high tolerance for risk, meaning that we are able to accept papers like this one or a paper on a, on a design fiction or, or visionary paper. Um, we also seem to ground significance not only to our own research body, but to society and industry. I, I, I guess that most of you would approve it with this uh, account. And then we want to learn more um, and, and, and uh, dive deeper into this paper. So we analyzed the best papers from last year's CHI and first made a couple of observations on, on how they are written, basically the writing culture that we have. It seems that the problems uh, per se, they are typically well described, whereas the capacities are often ambiguously described. So we can improve in, in that respect. The second observation was that uh, almost all the papers, there was only one exception, are uh, addressing empirical and constructive problems. So where are all the conceptual problems? So we, we argue that we're missing conceptual work that is tying together efforts in empirical domain and in the constructive domain. And this allowed us to explain why this big hole is happening. The big hole does not manifest that we are not progressing, which is progressing in a, in a particular way that could be called leapfrogging. So whenever there's a change in, in technology or context, our solutions that we developed earlier don't transfer into that new, new setting. Uh, if we were a more mature field, we would have progress like this, which would be initially a bit slower, but uh, be more reliable against or robust against external events uh, later on. Okay, uh, what you can use this problem-solving view for um, is to expose flaws in our belief systems to the extent that you can, you can articulate them. For example, the, the claims that we started with. Um, and the problem-solving perspective gives you two kinds of counter-arguments to many of them. First of all, that they tend to ignore uh, this diversity of, of problems and capacities we truly need in HCI. And then secondly, um, many of them focus on either the solution or the problem, ignoring the other one. And this creates an imbalance. Um, but we are not limited to just describing how things are. This can be used in a reverse manner, if you will, to generate ideas and refine ideas. So you can take the five criteria and, and you can generate heuristics or ideas on how you can improve your own work. And we offer a table in the paper that, that you can use as a starting point. Uh, to demonstrate that it's, it's of some value, we analyze Fitts law as a field. So it's a field that has existed for many decades and we could show that there are places where you can improve. There are basically goals that we can set for uh, Fitts law research that makes some sense. Of course, problem solving capacity per se doesn't say how those problems should be solved. It's a saying that there's opportunity to improve our problem solving capacity in that domain. Okay, so to summarize, uh, we're offering a discipline-free view of HCI research. It's a single concept, so if you only have limited capacity like I have for attention, then this is a nice candidate for describing HCI. And I hope that I've, I've shown that it's much richer than solutionism or your regular notion of problem solving. Uh, it also embraces variety without being naive, without making the fallacy that uh, every perspective is valuable just because they're different. Um, and it shows that we do have significant progress in our field. It's just limited into certain categories of progress. And it shows that we have a need to, to work on conceptual problems that can tie together empirical and, and constructive efforts. Finally, um, this is a full philosophy of science. Uh, you don't need to buy into that. You can use it also in a very pragmatic manner. You can use these tables and you can use these criteria to, to refine your research ideas. Thanks. I'm very optimistic that there are some questions. Come on. Hi. So um, I know that you talked about this idea of a problem as being an expansive idea of a problem, but I'm not sure that maybe you can tell me how the idea, so it seems like 
not all research is about solving problems, right? So some research is about understanding themes or ideas. Um, and one example is um, a paper here at this conference by Steve Benford was thinking about an idea of accountable artifacts. That's not something that's actually like making a solution to anything. That's understanding a space. You're not going to get to a final point. So how do things like that fit into this idea yeah. of problem solving? I didn't have time to go through all the subtypes of, of each of the problems, but they always start with the subtype one, which is basically complete absence of, of a problem description. Right? So it would count as a contribution like that. But I'm not sure it's ever going to get to a problem description. Sorry? I'm not sure it's ever going to get to a problem description. That's not the point. What is the point? <laughs> Insight, revelation, illumination. That would count as subtype one. Sorry. <laughs> so, hi there. Thanks for the talk, Sebastian Dieting from the University of York. I'm, I'm very much a pragmatist, so this kind of philosophy of science that to me kind of very much smells of pragmatism is right up my alley. Though my question is then, as a pragmatist, how does this change practice and not just the way we talk about things. So how does this not just, is yet another way in which we then write our introductions and our papers slightly differently in order to, in order to justify whatever it is we right now are interested in and, or whatever it is that we got money for, but how is this actually changing research practice? Yeah, I don't think there's any, any um, fast way to change the culture. Yeah. Right? So it starts with individuals thinking differently and then that seeps into their practices. And if they're better in their own work, then others will copy them, and maybe it will distribute like that. Right? We are using this in our lab, and it seems to work it there. Okay. So, so the, 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 the proof is in the pudding that your lab will be so much humongously more successful that everybody will follow on the bandwagon. Now we have 300 people in the room, so let's see this okay. here. Okay. Right? Thank you. Very nice work. Um, you've abstracted away the method, and I understand why you abstracted that away, but of course in order to judge the solution we need to n judge what the method was. So can you talk a bit more about that distinction, like when does the method come in, or is it the right suitable method for a particular problem? Um, one of the criterion was confidence, right? So you would evaluate the method in terms of how probable you hold that this problem-solving capacity that you claim holds, right? So then we would evaluate basically the methodology of that. So it would be part of the, of the evaluation of the solution then, right? Exactly. Yeah, okay, good. 